In 1951, Joan Bevan's husband told her he was bringing someone home to meet her, someone rather unusual. He warned me to be on my best behaviour because the man coming was different from anyone he or I had ever met. He had a thin face, grey curly hair, piercing blue eyes and was extremely handsome. And he made striking gestures with his hands when he was thinking or talking. Raymond Tallis, who is she talking about and why have you chosen him? She's talking about the great philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein. His philosophy illuminated every aspect of his life. It wasn't something he did, it's something he was. He was a thinker who was concerned, as Bertrand Russell said, not to win an argument, but really to find out how things are. He had the intellectual passion as nobody else has. And as such, to me, he's a remarkable role model. We're fortunate to be joined today by Ray Monk, Professor of Philosophy at the University of Southampton and the author of Ludwig Wittgenstein, The Duty of Genius, the acclaimed biography that's been credited with transforming Wittgenstein into a human being. Ray, how do you feel about Wittgenstein after living with him, as it were, for so long? Do do you know him? Do you feel you like him? I admire him hugely. He is, in my opinion, the greatest philosopher of the 20th century, and my admiration for him extends to Wittgenstein as a person as well as as a philosopher. I admire his uh, single-mindedness, his intensity, his integrity. My only doubt about, uh, I mean, on a personal level, is I don't think he would have liked me very much. His standards were very high and I would have been terrified of him. Mm. Wittgenstein can be very abstruse, totally stymied me as an undergraduate. So I brought the whistle that I never dared to bring into philosophy lectures at university and doing our listeners the slight discourtesy of assuming that some of them may be as dim as me, I intend to blow the whistle whenever we start going in too deep because we'll never explain Wittgenstein's whole philosophy in half an hour but we may hope to learn a little bit about his life. So talk us through his extraordinary family background. Where where and when was he born? He was born in 1889 in Vienna into an extraordinarily wealthy family. His his father, Karl Wittgenstein, more or less owned the iron and steel industry of the uh, Habsburg Empire and was fabulously wealthy. And it was a, a family in which expectations of intellectual achievement, uh, social achievement, were extremely high and were felt keenly by his siblings. No less than three of his brothers committed suicide. Ludwig Wittgenstein himself said that he many times thought of committing suicide um, and these thoughts probably only left him in, in the, the, the last half of his life. But the family home was also a terrific centre for the intellectual and artistic elite of Vienna. Uh, if they had a musical evening, Brahms would attend. They, they knew personally all the great painters of this period, Kokoschka, Klimt and, and, and so on. His, his sister was a great friend of Freud. It, this was a, a tremendous period of Viennese cultural life and the Wittgenstein family were right at the centre of it. Well, one, one sees the tragedy, uh, Raymond, and, and one sees the intensity. Do you also think there was any happiness in his child? childhood there were times when he seemed to have been very happy when he was completely absorbed in doing things he, he made a sewing machine out of bits and pieces that actually worked didn't he yes right? he did yes he, he, he was very when twisted. he was 10 <laughs> when he was 10 and un- unlikelihood upon unlikelihood he was at school with hitler yes he was for a short while at uh, the uh, real schule in in linz they, they were the same age they were born within a few days of one another hitler and wittgenstein but um Hitler, I think, was a year behind because he, you know, he wasn't very good at school. <laughs> and, uh, he was in the year below Wittgenstein. There is a reference in Mein Kampf to a Jewish boy at school, and many people have speculated that this was Wittgenstein. How Jewish was Wittgenstein? Well, he, he, uh, his family were brought up in complete isolation from the Jewish community in Vienna, which had a very strong and influential Jewish community. They never went to synagogue, but he counted as Jewish under the Nuremberg Laws because three of his grandparents were Jewish. So under the Nuremberg Laws, he, he was Jewish, which, which was an issue for him in the 30s. How did he end up in England, Raymond? Well, by a, a, a rather odd route. He, his, his first port of call was Manchester, where he studied aeronautical engineering. And then he got very interested, as it were, in the mathematical basis 
of aeronautical engineering, and then he got interested in the logical basis of mathematics. Wittgenstein went to Cambridge in 1911 and introduced himself to Bertrand Russell. He was queer, and his notions seemed to me odd, so that for a whole term I could not make up my mind whether he was a man of genius or merely an eccentric. At the end of his first term at Cambridge, he came to me and said, Will you please tell me whether I am a complete idiot or not? If I am a complete idiot, I shall become an aeronaut, but if not, I shall become a philosopher. I told him to write me something during the vacation on some philosophical subject, and I would then tell him whether he was a complete idiot or not. At the beginning of the following term, he brought me the fulfilment of this suggestion. After reading only one sentence, I said to him, No, you must not become an aeronaut. And he didn't. It's a tribute, I think, to Russell's generosity of spirit that within a few weeks of meeting Wittgenstein, he felt that he had to hand over the torch to this young genius. Yes. He felt he was the most clear example of genius he'd ever come across in his life. Russell also said this uh, of Wittgenstein, he has the theoretical passion very strongly. He doesn't want to prove this or that, but to find out how things are, it hurts him not to know. You've written, Raymond, that he had a sense that the world has a deeper secret meaning to yield up, meaning which transforms technical problems into matters of the utmost personal urgency, and that the purpose of the world is concealed in some way from us. What is it about philosophers like Wittgenstein that they're compelled to dwell on matters that most of us don't worry about, apart from the odd passing thought? I wish one knew what it was that drove great philosophers, because Mm. one might even aspire to be such a thing oneself. How did you come to philosophy? I came to philosophy through being engulfed by problems that I didn't recognise as being philosophical. When I was in my early teens, I did have a strange sense that the world was unreal. I was terribly worried that I I wasn't free, that I was just simply uh, a a node in a causal network of the world and so on, and these things really concerned Mm. me. And I wasn't able to articulate them. And I started reading philosophy and was absolutely astonished that there were people who had thought about these things before. And so I suppose I came to philosophy through being engulfed by the questions that ultimately I recognise as philosophical questions. There is a parallel then with Wittgenstein there. Um, I think one would have to be incredibly arrogant in any way to compare oneself with Wittgenstein. Should we say the parallel is that I was Ben Nevis and he is Mount Everest? So that might be a reasonable parallel, yes. Hmm. I think what Wittgenstein wanted was clarity. Uh, Wittgenstein became a philosopher not because he wanted a firm foundation for his beliefs but because he felt confused certain things confused him and he wanted to dispel the confusion I think I was probably impelled into philosophy by that sense of wanting to find out what I was in the world for feeling that it mattered what one was in the world for and if I could find out what the world was for and what I was in the world for it would give shape Except for Wittgenstein, that was probably the wrong sort of thing to look for Mm. in philosophy, even though he was greatly exercised by what the world was for, what he was for, and so on. Very early on, he felt that philosophy was not going to answer those kinds of questions. There were some questions that really lay beyond not merely philosophy, but beyond articulation. And that really was quite a revolutionary thought, because hitherto people perhaps had thought of philosophy as providing solutions Mm. to the problem of life. In 1913, his father, Carl, died and left him a huge personal fortune. Can can you explain that, Ray, and what he did with it? Well, he gave a large part of it away before the First World War and the rest of it away immediately after the First World War. In his accountant's words, he committed financial suicide. He he gave away his entire inheritance. (laughs) He he was. I've been looking at photographs of him, uh, and rather to my surprise, seen that he he was actually strikingly handsome. Oh, yes. Man, uh, attractive. Was he actually liked by lots of people? Did he have friends? Was he lionised? Was he sought after? No, not really. Most people who knew him commented on his exquisite manners. Mm. Um, He was impeccably polite. Uh, He himself felt that to be a problem. And and when he went to Cambridge for the first time, he felt under so many social obligations that it drove him to 
moved to Norway, to an isolated part of Norway, where he could work on his own. So he built himself a, a hut by the side of a field and, and uh, lived entirely alone. He didn't do things by halves. And that was a pattern throughout his life. He was always fleeing to lonely places, wasn't he? Yes, yes. And the, the interesting thing was that he was able to then think consistently for hour after hour after hour in these lonely places and you felt that was the most extraordinary thing without any external stimulus he was self-driven uh, one of his letters from Norway I think it was in 1940 described logic as hell yes. and in fact for him it was hell because he didn't stop thinking about it he didn't dance around it he really stood still like a long-legged fly on the water <laughs> um, just looking at the problem in a most unbearably intense way and in 1914, Austria declared war on Serbia. Wittgenstein volunteered for service and fought his way to the front line, apparently deliberately seeking out danger and being decorated for bravery. He was in the army for five years. A surprising kind of philosopher. Did he like it? Did he hate it, Ray? He felt that he benefited from it. He, he hated the people he was with. He didn't get on with them at all. He wanted the experience of facing death. He thought mm. that would make him a better person. He wanted that experience, and, and, and he got it in, in, in plenty. Eventually, the, because he was from such a, a well-connected family, it took a while to persuade the authorities that he actually wanted to be in the dangerous position. And they kept moving him behind the lines, and he kept applying to be transferred, and they kept moving him to still safer places. But eventually, he got to the, the, the Russian front, which, you know, um, there was plenty of uh, opportunity there to face death. Uh, the first Tractatus... Um, uh, Tell us, either of you, about that. What, what are the origins? When was it published? OK, it, it's, it's a unique book, The Tractatus. It, it, it's a unique mixture. On the one hand, it's a philosophical tract about logic, about symbolic logic. On the other hand, it's a work of mysticism. Now, in logic, he'd already distinguished between that which one can say and that which one can't say but has, one has to show. In 1916, he applied that idea to religion, the meaning of life, the ethical. These things, too, he now believed, could not be said. They had to be shown. But if they can't be said, what's the purpose of philosophy? Does a philosopher go around showing things? It's quite interesting. I mean, the famous last sentence of uh, the Tractatus Logico Philosophicus is that of which we cannot speak we must pass over in silence. That would be fatal to a columnist like me. <laughs> and it, it indeed might be fatal for any academic. Yes. And it was often said that his silence was quite noisy, mm. that he couldn't quite leave it alone entirely like that, although there was a long period when he did leave it alone. I think the attempt to define the limits of language, the limits of that which could be spoken, the extent to which uh, one's world was to some extent defined by the language he used, he felt that was in itself worthwhile. The task of philosophy, as he understood it, was to understand the structure of thought. And this is where logical form comes in. So logical form is that which gives our thinking its structure. It's also that which gives the world its structure. And it's also that which gives language its structure. So the idea here is you have three things. You have the world, our thoughts about the world and language, which is those thoughts put into words. Logical form is what those three things have in common. He talked a lot about mental cramp, and I know what he meant um, <laughs> going to lectures at Cambridge on Wittgenstein. I got the mental cramp. He talked about philosophy being a struggle against the bewitchment of our intelligence by language. Was he understood at the time? Was the Tractatus understood? Was it a success? It was a great success. It was one of the most dominant. Um, it gave birth to logical positivism, but Ray, again, you can pick us up. Well, OK, there. let me just say this then, that the logical positivists were hugely influenced by Wittgenstein, but they were influenced by Wittgenstein to take up a point of view that was diametrically opposed to Wittgenstein. No, one, of, one, one of the logical positivists, Otto Neurath, in echoing the, the last sentence of the Tractatus, whereof one cannot speak, thereof one must be silent, Otto Neurath said, we must indeed be silent, but not about anything. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, that's hugely illuminating. <laughs> and then he comes back to Cambridge in, is it 1929? 29. Uh, as a lecturer. Within, within a year he started lecturing. You mentioned, Ray, earlier on, his uh, frequent uh, absconsion, so to speak, to Norway. 
uh, often to be on his own, but not always to be on his own. He he had a, a very good friend, a, a young man called David Hume Pinsent. Is that he had a a number of such friends. The first of whom was was David Pinsent. Yes, yeah. yeah. But David Hume Pinsent was uh, a pretty important to him. When Pinsent died, mm. uh, Wittgenstein uh, said, he has taken half my life yeah. with him, yeah. and the devil will take the other half. Yeah. You, you don't say about that about any old friend. No, no. He's clearly in love with Pinsent. Yeah. Uh, and, and the Tractatus is dedicated to Pinsent's memory. Mm. He went on holiday twice with Pinsent and was utterly distraught when news came of Pinsent's death. Uh, uh, so yes, Pinsent was very close, and and th- th- that was that was before the First World War. In 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 the thirties, he had a similar friendship with another young man called Francis Skinner. Were these relationships consummated in any way? Do you think that with Skinner was um, another another rumor when I was at university, Raymond, was that he he would like to go to the cinema and um, watch westerns and sit right at the front so that he was staring straight at the, the, the screen. And he used to go to cinema, particularly with Norman Malcolm, who was one of his pupils. It was basically to almost drive out the contents of his mind with something else. And so he just wanted to be completely zapped by the cinema because he could not stop thinking. At times it was absolutely unbearable. And that was at a time when I think most heroically... He was thinking without trying to develop a system. He was just, each day, he was thinking as if from the beginning. And you can see it in his later works, his his philosophical investigations and so on. You can see him arguing with himself. You know, out of the argument with others, we Mm. make rhetoric. Out of the argument with ourselves, we make philosophy. And he was always arguing with himself. And that unbearable state of self-quarrel, I guess he sought all sorts of escapes from it. Comics, the cinema, and so on. Can I just say, I'm not entirely sure I see his love of the cinema as an escape. He he had a genuine love of the cinema. Yeah. Um, Westerns. He, he loved movies, he loved Westerns, he loved musicals. Mm. When he went to America, he wanted to meet Carmen Miranda. Mm. He loved those movies. And uh, Gilbert Ryle, the British philosopher, was for a while a, um, a close friend of Wittgenstein's. And he recalls that he and Wittgenstein argued about cinema because um, Gilbert Ryle would not agree with Wittgenstein that there could not possibly be a good British movie. Ryle agreed that there hadn't in fact been a good British movie but he didn't agree that such a thing was an impossibility. Wittgenstein quite genuinely believed that there there was an impossibility because cinema was a young art form and it belonged with a young civilization, a young culture like America and he, he thought there was far more to be hoped for from a young culture like America than from the old decaying dying culture of Western Europe. And it shows what a philosopher he was, so that his a priori assumptions were completely resistant to any empirical data. <laughs> <laughs> when, when Pinsent said to him, you're mad, uh, he replied, God preserve me from sanity, and when Russell heard about the exchange, he remarked, God certainly will. Uh, was he mad? No. No. <laughs> <Certainly not. laughs> Absolutely not. I mean, he... He's, he he suffered enormously from um, mood swings, from, and particularly including d- depression. He suffered enormously uh, with being a driven person, but he wasn't mad in the sense of, uh, of any clinical madness that I would recognise, yeah. or clinical syndrome that I would recognise. No, I mean, no. He, wasn't, he wasn't the least bit insane, no. uh, um, eccentric. Mm. And then returned to Cambridge completely to reverse everything he'd written. D- d- he started to pull apart his, his own, the Tractatus? It was a gradual process. I mean, it started really in the late 20s when he'd pretty well given up on the idea of logical form, I guess, and found it a difficult idea. And he started actually looking beyond a relationship between language as such and the world to look at the details of actual languages. Mm. And he, acknowledged, he recognised that, for example, words had different functions. They were more like tools. And he also focused on the different uses of language. You know, we use words to greet people, we use words to curse. We don't just use words to make statements of fact, which can then be mapped onto the world in some way. So he, he really got himself deeper and deeper into the complexities of living language and recognising that language was a, an expression of a way of life. He, he came up with such poetic and 
mysterious lines as uh, if a lion could speak we would not be able to understand what he said or Heraclitus said you cannot step into the same river twice I say you can't step into the same river once these things used to trouble me as an undergraduate as Raymond was saying just now Wittgenstein's view of language changed somewhat so that he no longer was interested in trying to analyse the structure of language yeah Uh, now what he emphasised was that You can't understand language without understanding a form of life. Language is Mm. woven into our practices, our, our, our customs, the things that we do. If a lion could talk, we would not understand him. Why not? Because we don't share the form of life of a lion. So the things that the lion says would be unintelligible to us. And if only those who tried to train chimps to speak English or to communicate with humans using sign language had realised that they wouldn't have wasted many decades of uh, research time. They don't have our form of life, so there's no way they could... En- there isn't anything right. they'd want to say to us. Uh, nothing intelligible to either no. party. Yes. It appeals a bit like T.S. Eliot, though, to me, that you, d- you think you sort of understand it, but you don't quite understand it, and yet you instinctively feel it's a, it's, it's a very beautiful and important idea. Stupid people like like me, at least in, in this field, have a tendency, when they really can't understand something, to say there is nothing to be understood, it's the Emperor's new clothes, all those people who say Wittgenstein's great, they don't really understand him either, they're just saying so because everybody says Wittgenstein's great. Uh, have you ever wondered whether the Emperor had any clothes, whether he was really saying anything? Whenever I'm reading the philosophical investigations, I have absolutely no doubt that the emperor, emperor's clothes are real clothes. If you get engaged in his process of thought, you realise you're in the company of an incomparable mind. You may not be able to abstract from it a set of propositions or even a world picture. He wouldn't want you to do either of those. But engaging with him paragraph by paragraph, and it is extraordinary to see him. He keeps on interrupting himself. He's arguing with himself. You're overhearing one of the most amazing dialogues for one that you could ever imagine by january 1951 his health was declining rapidly and his doctor edward bevan at cambridge invited him to stay with the family for the last days uh, joan bevan with whom we started again on april the 27th two days before he died we had a walk to the pub that night he became violently ill i stayed with him in his room the night of the 28th and we told him his close friends in England would be coming the next day. Before losing consciousness that night, he said, Tell them I've had a wonderful life. Tell them I've had a wonderful life. Was it? Yes. Wonderful in, in, its, in, in its purity. I think there were two things motivating Wittgenstein always. One we've talked about is philosophical clarity. The other is moral decency. So what he's trying to do always is to think clearly and to behave decently. So was it a wonderful life? Yes, because it was driven by wonderful aspirations and he lived up to his own exacting standards to an extraordinary extent. It was a wonderful life. I mean, it was a very painful life. It was full of suffering, great loneliness. He had a huge problem with ordinary human beings who had the necessary balm to help him to cope with his solitude but whom he found very difficult to deal with Uh, and yet it was indeed I think one of the most wonderful lives and I would totally support what Reyes said it was all of a piece he hung together, he was coherent as very few people are, he was a man that you felt had integrity that linked his philosophy with his very way of being 